Okay, everybody, we're going to um, review some of the dimorphic endemic fungal infections. Uh, keep in mind that the word dimorphic means it grows in the yeast in the mold phase. Endemic means it's located to some areas and not others. So some of these are dimorphic and not endemic and vice versa. So um, the first one we're going to talk about, if I can pick the right button here. <clears throat> it's not working. If I push page down, shouldn't it go down? Let's see here. <laughs> Let's see here. OK. There. There we go. OK, so this is a lesion where a guy was working in his garden. It usually was rose bushes classically. Then it turns out to be sphagnum moss, which is hanging out of the cypress trees. It starts in the fingertip and then it works up the lymphatic. So the diagnosis is a syndrome called nodular lymphangitis and the obvious bug we're going to talk about is sporotrichosis, right? However, uh, this is called a sporotrichoid pattern. The differential, what is the second most common cause of a nodular lymphangitis if sporotrichosis is number one? Anybody know? Cardia. It's um, no cardia. Very good. And which species? Brasiliensis. Okay. And then what's the third most common? It's Mycobacterium marinum, very good. And then Leishmania, uh, can it rarely do it? Uh, so nodular lymphangitis may or may not be due to sporotrichosis. So those are the, the classic ones. Here it is working up the arm, which is a classic lympho, lymphatic spread from a distal site. Now, what do you call on the microscopic picture if you're looking to diagnose this as sporotrichosis in a macrophage? What do you call those uh, crystal looking things? Those are called cigar bodies because they look like a cigar. So if you are a microbiologist, you could say it's consistent with sporotrichosis. Now, what you may not know is sporotrichosis is actually dimorphic. I just showed you the yeast phase. That's the mold phase. So this is a dimorphic fungus, but it's not really endemic to some location. OK, so it's in the dimorphic pattern. Sporotrichosis could be ulcerative. It could be nodular. It, it, it could be on your legs, your arms, but you always want to look for the lymphatic spread. It could be a large ulcer, but notice there is proximal spread. If you're immune suppressed and you inhale sporotrichosis, it disseminates and aids patients immune suppressed. You get these nonspecific pustules, papules all over your body. And there is the cigar bodies, okay? So that's how you diagnose it. Now, when my, my dad had this in 1970s, okay, uh, because he was working on plants with sphagnum moss with a lime trees puncturing his hand and it got in there. Uh, they actually gave him potassium iodide, which works, but you have to take small drops and increase the dose. So then this slide is obviously old because it says itraconazole was investigational back then. That's the drug of choice for it. And then we had a guy, a lady recently uh, in clinic who had it in her electron bursa with no lymphatic spread. It grew in culture and she was on chemo and couldn't take itraconazole and she wasn't sick enough to get amphobe or ambisome. So Rod looked it up and we gave her terbinafine, lamisil, which also works and it didn't interact with her chemo. So the key is to try to get it drained out. So how are you going to diagnose it? You're going to diagnose by culture like we did the lady. So they just said, here's sporotrichosis. Oh, consult ID or histopath. And that cigar body sometimes is called an asteroid body. And then if you see it and you don't grow it, that's likely it. 
uh, serology is not very uh, helpful or used mostly. So the differential are the things we already talked about, and you can also throw in there two luremia. So those are the five classic nodular lymphangitis. So when I present this case, everyone says, oh, this is sporotrichosis, which is a good answer, but the best answer is it's nodular lymphangitis until you know that for sure it's sporotrichosis. Okay. Now, if you go into a cave in Cancun, Mexico, and you come out with all these bats and birds, and now in 24 to 48 hours, you're hypoxic and your x ray looks like this, what is your diagnosis? Histoplasmosis. And um, what is your treatment at this exact story? It's steroids. It's not antifungals. You have a hypersensitivity pneumonitis from inhaling billions of spores. So if you were shoveling hay or mulch and you breathed in a ton of aspergillus spores, the treatment is steroids, not antifungals. If you were pressure washing the mold off of your uh, house or your driveway without a mask, and you breathe in tons of water organisms and you're hypoxic a day or two later, you have hypersensitivity pneumonitis due to mycobacterium non-tuberculosis, the treatment of steroids. So these are the acute presentations. You forgot to look at the sign that says this area is contaminated with histo, keep out. Now, histo, blasto, coxy, paracoxy, it loves your mouth and your nose. And okay, so when you see stuff in your mouth that looks like a cancer, your tongue, it could be anywhere in your body with an ulcer, it could show up with any pattern in your lungs, diffuse, nodular. Uh, now, this is a rare presentation, but we had it at Moffitt. And the patient is 20 years old. Her x ray looks totally normal, but um, she bends over and she passes out and her arms are swollen and her head is swollen. So she has what? Superior vena cava syndrome. And then how does histo do that? She has fibrosing mediastinitis. So as you inhale histo, it goes to the proximal hilar lymph nodes. And if it crushes the mediastinal structures, whether it's a main stem bronchus, superior vena cava, or any other mediastinal structure like your esophagus, which we've had. If it's in the acute stage, you give them steroids and itraconazole and they get rheumatic relief, okay? But in this stage, there is no antifungal gonna get rid of this because the massive lymph nodes are gone and it's now fibrotic. So the number one cause of a fibrosing mediastinitis is histoplasmosis. The second cause is tuberculosis and the third is Hodgkin's and the fourth is radiation therapy. So this lady, if you look closely, has a nitinol stent put in her superior vena cava, and she doesn't need antifungals. It's all burned out at that stage. This guy obviously has dilated blood vessels from superior vena cava. Here's a awesome diagram of what acute histo looks like, where the mediastinum and the massive inflammation is crushing the mediastinal structure is giving you superior vena cava. This responds to itra and steroids. Now, this is one of the most common histo presentations we ever see, which is nodules. Now, notice the nodules are almost as small as miliary TB, but they're just a little bigger. So you could say this almost looks like miliary TB, but it's histo. That's why they look so closely alike. This is a Moffitt patient who had a nodule they thought was lung cancer, and they removed it. It's a histoplasmoma, and those um, don't typically disseminate all over the body, and they're usually one coin lesion or so in somebody who's immune competent. This is an AIDS patient with disseminated histo, which can look like anything from papular, rarely is it ever vesicular, and uh, more commonly, it looks like papulosquamous. When you use the word papulosquamous, the number one rash that's papulosquamous is secondary syphilis. This looks like secondary syphilis, 
in an AIDS patient, but it's actually histo. And then when you biopsy it, you may see granulomas. If the CD4 is less than 200, you see no granulomas. If it's over 200, you can see granulomas. And then what's unique about histo, it has a narrow base bud. It's two to four microns, so it's small, whereas blasto is 20 microns. So this is small, and it looks like a little oval shape. So that, the, a trained microbiologist could pick this up, okay? Now, the best stain to pick up fungus is the Gomori methanamine silver stain instead of the PAS stain, which I showed you. This outlines it even better. So this GMS stain is the best looking at it. These are cases at Moffitt we've had of Histo and Ramon Sandine, who was our microbiologist, took all these pictures and he can tell you that this is Histo. This is degenerating Histo after it's been around a while and your immune system's killing it, and that is the GMS stain. So you can see Histo with H&E, it's usually in a macrophage. You can see it on a gram stain, you can see it on a right stain, and then, of course, the GMS is the one they like to go to. So that is what histo looks like. You get the size of histo being small compared to the macrophage, so it fills a macrophage. Uh, and then uh, what you'll get in the boards is somebody has a nose that's eaten up, and they've been in Central South America, and they'll show you that picture on the left, and they want you to tell them, is it Leishmania or is it histo? So that's histo because it looks like it has a capsule, but it's not a capsule. It's a staining artifact on the left. And if it was Leishmania, it would have a kinetoplast, a small dot next to the big dot nucleus, but they're the exact same size. So you would see Leishmania in a macrophage with a small dot next to a big dot. But if you don't see the little dot, that's histo. That's on every board question, guaranteed. That picture wants you to distinguish Leishmania from Histo because they both eat up your nose. Notice two to four micron, it does not have a capsule. There it is on other stains. Now, it is dimorphic, so if you grow it, the uh, top side looks white and the bottom looks uh, this yellow color and it's waxy, cottony. So that's what it looks like in the, in the auger plate. Now, in the world of AIDS in the 1980s, um, and you had disseminated histo and you suspected it, you could run down to the lab with um, some of their blood, put it in a centrifuge. It will give you a little pellet at the bottom called the Buffy coat, which is all the cells. You then do a blood smear of it, and you look around on this Buffy coat, which has all the red cells and white cells. You look for a macrophage, and you see one. And notice it has on high power histo in the macrophage. And you say, aha, I now know this person has disseminated histo. And you made the diagnosis by that spin down. So that's disseminated histo. This is a liver biopsy showing you histo in a granuloma. And you know that histo is in your differential of retinitis. So... You can get retinitis from CMV, herpes, zoster, syphilis, and histo also gives you retinitis. Now, if you're an ophthalmologist, you can look at that and say, that's histo, with pretty, whereas I, to me, I can't tell the difference. But an ophthalmologist can possibly say, I think this is histo based on this, that, and the other. So here's the typical nodules you see everywhere on people, and that one. And there's the budding yeast. Now, this guy at Moffitt came in, and he needs a bone marrow transplant for his leukemia and remission. And they want to rush him to uh, transplant, but he has nodules everywhere. So they bronch him. The bronch is negative. And then in the next few weeks, he's got more nodules, and he can't go to transplant. So they do an open lung biopsy. It's histo by histopath, and we put him on VFAN, and then within a month, his nodules are almost all gone, and he goes safely to transplant, and he did fine. So there's an example of histo at Moffitt, keeping somebody from a transplant who fortunately 
got his transplant, but it required an open lung biopsy. Now, as you know, Histo likes the Mississippi, Ohio River Valley area, especially Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, Missouri, Arkansas, and Tennessee. That's sort of the hot zone. Now, I was always under the impression Histo is never in Florida, but apparently there are articles finding it in caves, okay? But the probability of you catching Histo in Florida is very rare, but it is here, okay? So I've been proven wrong on that one. So you can see Histo, uh, by some people's estimate, is actually going outside its endemic zone, okay? Um, I like this one because this one um, shows Histo all the way in Florida and everywhere else, but we think Histo's only in the United States. What we don't realize is Histo's in Africa and Asia and Europe and Central South America. So Histo in the Caribbean islands, it's not just in our place, the U.S., okay? And then um, the Histo is inhaled and then it can disseminate and then caves and bat colonies may get in there. Did you know that when they built the Indianapolis Freeway, they, the wind was blowing as they were excavating, and all these people in Indianapolis get histo. Okay, so if you stir up construction, you can spread histo pretty far with the wind blowing. So it's sort of like somewhat of a bioterrorism agent. Did you know that um, in Dominican Republic, they had this um, tunnel and they sent these guys in there to shovel the meter deep bat guano that's been there for a hundred years. And it looks like 28 were hospitalized, nine went to the ICU, six intubated and three died. So this is histo in a Dominican Republic cake outbreak, okay? So some people say it's Darling's disease. The species is, is Capsulatum that we have, but if you go to Africa, you can get a different variety, Dubosii, and another one in the Middle East. So there's actually eight clades with differences in the histo, and the species may not be the same, but the treatment is all the same. So most of our histo. Now, can histo affect your dog or cat? Yes, so if you study veterinarian medicine, here's dogs with histo on their nose, their mouth, just like humans, their eye, it's in their lungs, so they can get disseminated histo. So yes, dogs do get histo. You cannot get histo from your dog, okay? Now, the second one, again, likes your nose. This is the second one, we're off histo. And it likes your mouth, but it tends to be verrucous cauliflower but it doesn't have to be, it could be ulcerative. Again, it mimics cancer. So you'd think this guy has a cancer. Uh, this one again is verrucous around the mouth, another one. And this one's on the leg, it's verrucous. And this one is flat and ulcerative. And then when it shows up in the lungs, it looks like a cannonball, okay? They're usually big, like a cannonball, and it loves the hilum. So when you see a big mass in the hilum, it mimics cancer, obviously. And then, of course, it's big, 20 microns, and has a broad base bud. And they all begin with the letter B, B broad base bud, big. So, of course, we're talking about blastomycosis. Broad base bud, big is blasto. Nose, skin, cannonballs, hilum. Those are the key. Now, blasto likes to go to bones up to 20% of the cases when they disseminate. So osteomyelitis is also true. If you look where blasto is, it's exactly like histo, but it goes up into Canada, Wisconsin further, and it goes into Canada up the uh, New England area more so, and even further east. So when you look at uh, blasto, I will say there is no blasto in Tampa, Florida, at least for now, okay? So Florida is spared, unlike histo. Uh, I was amazed to see that blasto is in Africa because I didn't know that, but these are where blasto can be found and a slight little bit in India has some blasto.
Uh, now, the most common blasto is dermatitides, and they have names like Chicago disease and Gilchrist. But there's other blastos, uh, Gilchristii, etc. And then they have some blastos that go into this new name called Ammonsia. So these are the different blasto species. So again, it's soil, but it likes uh, rivers and lakes. And if you contaminate the soil, you can get it. And it likes to disseminate and immune suppress people. And it loves to mimic cancer. Now, here's the key point. Even though histoblastococci can affect dogs and cats, if it's a board question and a guy goes hunting and his dog gets pneumonia and then he gets pneumonia and they're in the same area, that's blasto. So they love to present the case of your dog getting pneumonia and you getting pneumonia. Even though it can occur with coxy histo, they love to use blasto as that example. So here's um, a bunch of people in an island in Wisconsin, which is full of blasto. And they went uh, near, they went kayaking and they go near the soil and brush near water, it's rivers, and they get 51 confirmed cases and 39 probables in a two month period. And they put a sign up saying, keep off this island. Okay, so that's blasto outbreak. And then blasto's dimorphic. So again, you see this mold phase versus the yeast phase and the different color to it. And then uh, this is a case of blasto with the differential. The person prevents with an ulcer. They think it's pyoderma gangrenosum and a pneumonia. And it turns out all of these possibilities are there. And it turns out this person had blasto. So they published the case showing you how blasto mimics various diseases. So you could see your differential is quite broad there if you got this case. So as I said, dogs, it looks just like the histo case, right? So blasto, the dog's nose, the mouth, losing the eye, vision, the tongue, the verrucous lesion, the pneumonia. So the dog goes hunting and gets blasto, and then the human gets it too because they're in the same environment. They didn't catch it from each other. So that's blasto. Now, we're going to go out west, and this is the desert, the acidic soil. And you can uh, see that this soil is a little different. And this one likes the nose too. So it's in the same category. But when you look under the microscope, you see this classic entity that gives away the diagnosis. And what's the diagnosis? Of course, out west, it's what? Coccidioidomycosis. And what is this thing called? This circle with those little things in it. A spherule, thank you. This is a spherule, and you're looking at the endospores inside. So that is classic coxy. There's a spherule with endospores. Here's a spherule with endospores being released. Now, the number one cause of erythema multiform and enodosum that's due to a fungus, that particular question is coccidioidomycosis, okay? So that's another classic board question. Which fungus is the number one cause of enodosum emultiform? It's coccidioidomycosis. And there you have these cutaneous immunologic reasons. Now, one thing unique about coxy, because it could look like anything in the lungs, is if you ever see a thin-walled cavity like that, the number one diagnosis is coccidioidomycosis, especially if they've been out west. So this is our patient that we published who has the classic thin-walled cavity. And so we published the case and we looked up what gives you a thin-walled cavity. Well, coxy, squamous cell, case report of plasto, histo, echinococcus, pneumocystis, mycobacterium. But for the most part, coxy leads the list. So that's the number one cause. Now, the other thing uh, unique about this lady that we published besides the beautiful thin-walled cavity is she failed fluconazole. So that's the drug of choice, but when you fail flucon, what's your next drug of choice, which is in the title, is posaconazole, and she beautifully responds to posaconazole. So that is the case of coxie. Here's some of Ramon Sandine's pictures over 25 years at Moffitt. 
Guy comes in, they think he has lung cancer. And um, one lady goes every year for five years to Vegas to gamble. And she says, I fly into Vegas, I get a taxi, I go to the casinos, I stay there for three, five days, and then I fly out. I don't go anywhere else. I just walk in Vegas and airport. And she comes back with Coxie with that history. Okay. So if you just walk around, you can get Coxie. Here's the lung. Okay. And there she is with her lung nodule. And there's the spherule with the endospores. Nice calca floor, 450 mag. There. Now, this was really weird. This patient had what doesn't happen commonly where it actually goes into the mold phase. It's going mold on us and it's causing the arthrocanidia endospores over here. And so this thing doesn't usually do this in the human body. It does it in the lab. This is actually doing it in the human body. So you don't see it doing that in the most patients, okay? So here's a ghost spherule. So that thing up there is empty of endospores, so it's a ghost. And then here's some pictures. It has arthrocanidia that are barrel shaped. So if you see the mold phase as barrel shaped, that's classic coxie, okay? But they're really gonna show you on the boards an endospore <coughs> inside spherules. This is the mold phase with these arthrocanidia and these endospores, whether they're in a spherule or not. That's a GMS stain at the bottom. Here's the beautiful mold phase with the barrel shape um, arthrocanidia. Now, one thing of all these things, uh, one of our attendings claims that they showed him a plate and they opened it up and said, what is this? And he goes, you've just killed me because it's coxie. Okay, so lab exposure is a big problem. That's why they work under a hood and we've had lab people needing prophylaxis because they weren't under the hood and the lid came off, okay? And it turns out it's not aspergillus, it's coxie, okay? So coxie is out west from Texas to California. Even though they had cases in New York, they had traveled out west. This is called the Haboob, H-A-B-O-O-B, -O -O the dust storm in Tucson, and coxie is coming at you, big time. <laughs> Phoenix, okay? That stuff is loaded with coxie. <laughs> All right. Now, that, I don't know where this occurs, but here's actually a market called the coxie market. And why they called it that, I have no idea. Okay? <laughs> All right. Now, uh, remember, in coxie, there are two species. Imidus is the most common, and posidaceae is the other one. We still treat them no matter what. Um, they claim that the unusual thing about coxie is it doesn't have a yeast phase. It has these little arthrocanidae that make endospores. So sometimes that confuses you. Of course, it's called valley fever for California's San Joaquin Valley, desert rheumatism, okay, out desert. Notice it's up in Washington State, Texas to California. But look at this. It's in Central South America, but it's nowhere else in the world. This is where coxie is limited to our continent, okay? And then um, the San Joaquin Valley, Valley Fever, and then the Posidaceae is in other states as opposed to the California strain, but we treat them pretty much all the same, whatever you wanna call it. And then um, again, disturbing the soil. Now here's what, and construction. So here's what is gonna be on your boards. This is unique. If you're Filipino, we had an IV attending who taught me and he came from the Philippines and he says, I refuse to go out west because I can die of disseminated coxie because my genetic makeup is such that I can get dissemination. So I'm not going to IDSA, ID Week out west. <laughs> and uh, this, this is certain groups of people who are more possible immune competent getting um, so you want to keep that in mind, certain uh, ethnic groups, okay? Now, uh, here's a bunch of students in Mexico excavating an old uh, site, and they're digging in the soil, and um, 
48 get symptoms because they're digging coxy soil. That's in Mexico, sorry. So there's an example of digging soil and getting stirring up the coxy. Now, here's a coxy case that we published, which was a guy getting the infliximab, and then he presents with uh, coxy pneumonia with arthritis. There's his coxy in his lung. And there's the spherules, and we diagnosed them, and we treated him initially with Flucon, and then he got Vori before Posa was even around. Uh, and then he actually got it to go to his eye. So this guy had a really bad case of it, and he wound up getting a Vori. Another case of uh, Coxie was in our ortho group. They thought this guy with a swollen joint had pigmented villonodular synovitis, so they open up his knee and they don't find PVS, they find Coxy in his knee. And uh, there's his knee with this junk in it. And there's the Coxy spherule. And uh, here's his knee when they opened it up with all that nodular stuff. And so this is a case of Coxy in the knee uh, at Moffitt. It was not an infection. Now, other interesting articles is the lab exposure with COXI is so well known in the ID literature. This is a whole article on what do you do as an expert when they call you because someone opened up the auger and now you got all these lab people exposed to COXI. So whether they're going to take Flucon or not, that's debatable. Another big thing you should know about COXI, it's one of the major causes of eosinophilic meningitis of a fungus. So that's number one. So when you're seeing eosinophilic meningitis, you're thinking, oh, this person has one of those angiostrongulus something or other, but it could be coxy. Number two, coxy CNS is so bad, it kills so many people, you may need to be on treatment for life. Okay, that's really how bad. Coxy meningitis is bad, bad. Notice our fellow from 10, 15 years ago, Fariba Donovan is in Arizona. And she's become a coxie expert. So you'll see her name on a lot of this stuff. Okay, so I always highlight her. Um, here is a New England Journal of Medicine person showing up as a short one pager, coxie on the tongue. And there's your spherule. And you should know immediately this is coxie looking at that. And they did some antibody antigen testing. Now, dogs get coxie. But the test question is blasto. Just remember that. So there's blast coxy in the dogs. So veterinarians know about coxy. Now, I love the history of medicine. Who is the father of the United States? Give me the name. Who? George Washington. George Washington. Thank you. <laughs> Who's the father of South America that you're looking at? Bolivar. Thank you. And what country did they name his? Well, Thank you. OK, now there's a guy named uh, Makoyak at Maryland State. He's an ID doc and he loves to write about how people died. And he goes through the whole history of medicine that's known about them. How do you think he died? Well, paracoxy is on the list. So is tuberculosis and so is arsenic. So if you want to read about it, Philip Makowiak wrote books and articles. He's great because he tells you how everybody died who are famous, including him. And he makes it, he's an ID doc, so he makes it really interesting. Okay, so he'll tell you how he died based on reading everything he could find on him. And there's the differential of how Simone Bolivar died. And notice Paracoxy is on the list, so is Histo and TB. Notice arsenic is on the list and other things, okay? Uh, now, did you know in Caracas, Venezuela, at the National Pantheon, his body is there, okay? And did you know that Hugo Chavez, who is now dead, but back then, he excavated and took some of his DNA and he tested it for all this stuff, but nobody knows what they found. So we are still waiting for the final proof of what he died of. So that was an interesting article. So in summary, histo, 
and Blasto, very similar, but Florida gets Histo, Blasto doesn't. Epoxy out west. And then I like this overlap here. Where are you safe in the continental US is Montana? <laughs> right up there. Okay. Okay. Now let's talk about another one that likes your nose and mouth, and it's Verrucus. And it looks like Blasto, and it looks very Verrucus, like a fungus or a cancer. And it likes your gums. And it can get in your liver and other. Oh, look at that. This is classic. It looks like a pilot's wheel from an old ship with the spokes sticking out. And it has multiple daughter cells. And you're in Central South America. So, of course, you're talking about what? Paracoxidioidomycosis. So, whenever you see the multiple daughter cells, that's paracoxic, and it does all the same things that Blasto and, Par and Coxie can do. It's usually paracoxy brasiliensis. By the way, a lot of things have the name species brasiliensis. Did you know that? Sure. We have nocardia brasiliensis, we have leishmania brasiliensis, and we have paracoxy brasiliensis. And so that's three bugs species named after Brazil. Now, let's go to Southeast Asia. And you got a guy who has AIDS and he has pneumonia and he's getting these molluscum like skin lesions that have central umbilication. So your differential of central umbilication is crypto, molluscum contagiosum, zoster, and this bug too. So there's the papules and the central umbilication, the dissemination. And then look at that. It's in a macrophage, almost like histo, but it's not histo. Okay, there's nothing at, there's no description that helps you to tell what that is, but it's about the same size. Uh, now, this will help you. It's a red pigmented mold. It's dimorphic. So I showed you the yeast phase. This is a mold phase. And it's, it's endemic to Southeast Asia. And so, of course, this is called what? used to be called Penicillium marnefii, and they renamed it what? Thank you, Teleromyces. So Teleromyces or Penicillium marnefii looks like penicillin with a paintbrush, and it has the red pigmented mold, and the yeast is not really pathognomonic for anything, but it's out in uh, Southeast um, Asia. Of course, things that are in Southeast Asia don't stay in Southeast Asia. So they may report a case in Central South America out of the blue and surprise everybody. But for the most part, it's staying in that area. Now, this is one of my favorite maps because it shows you Coxy, Blasto, Histo in the United States, Paracoxy with some Histo in South America, Africa, it shows you the Histo. Over in Southeast Asia, it shows you the uh, Teleromyces. Uh, notice it thrives to throw sporotrichosis and make it endemic, but I don't think it fits too well. And then if you really want a rare question, look at South Africa. What do you get in South Africa? You get that word again, amontiosis, another dimorphic fungus that nobody's ever heard of. So you probably won't get on the board South Africa, but you will get Southeast Asia with the Teleromyces. It's treated with um, Ambisome, Itra, but not Flucon and Vori. So how related are these? Coxy and Paracoxy are pretty close. Blastohistone are pretty close to each other, but they're different than Coxy. Teleromyces is different than all the others. It's closer to Aspergillus, and Sporotrichosis is way at the top. So this is how they're somewhat related to each other, but not in other ways. So in summary, spherules at the top, Coxy. If you look at the uh, bottom one, that one is a narrow base bud, and it's crypto, which I haven't covered. And then at the bottom is Histo with its very small side, also a narrow base bud. And down at the bottom is the spherule and the endospores. And then here's a nice diagram of the mold phase versus what are you going to see in the yeast phase? The paracoxy, easy to tell. 
the histo narrow base bud blasto is supposed to be broad base but it doesn't look like it up there and the spherule endospores are supposed to give it away and then crypto has the capsule and the narrow base bud so remember that now if you order a um, beta glucan you can pick up pneumocystis aspergillus and candida will it be positive for dimorphic fungi not classically but it could be galactomannan is more geared towards the aspergillus and then if you do a histoantigen that obviously helps you with histo as do sometimes the antibody Toxy antigen and antibody and the blasto antigen and antibody so at moffitt we don't have a coxy antigen we have a coxy antibody we do have a histo antigen and we do have a blasto uh, antigen and then that's it for my talk on the dimorphic fungi and i won't go into the crypto other than saying this because crypto has a geographic residence i want to show you a quick little picture these are all crypto cases which almost look like histoblasto when they show up as a nodule you know it as causing meningitis but um, i want you to know that besides neoformans there's a crypto species called gadii that can affect normal immune competent people it goes to their brain abscesses meningitis and nodules but what is the one immunodeficiency that gadii can be associated with in a non-aids patient and a non-cancer patient do you know what autoantibody to not interferon but gmcsf okay so make sure when you get your crypto gadii disseminated case test them for autoantibodies to gmcsf because they might need infliximab to knock out the autoantibodies okay well, here's why i want to show you crypto because i'm doing endemic it's not really endemic but gadii was first reported uh, in the united states near vancouver seattle and then they started finding it in California, Oregon, and Arizona. So we thought it was only out west, and it was in healthy people as well as uh, not healthy. So we worked with the CDC because we actually had a case in Florida, and it was never east of the Mississippi River. It was always out west, okay, historically. But crypto is everywhere, but different clades and genotypes and serotypes exist. This is a CDC slide and a guy that loves crypto. And see see that picture, it's all out west. This is an early picture from the CDC. It likes eucalyptus trees that koala bears eat on. So this is the publication we worked on with the CDC. And we said we had a case in Pasco County, immune competent disseminated meningitis crypto gadii. That was the black dot. One of our fellows who went up working in Polk County got another case. That's the red triangle dot. And then the CDC threw in their little Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, and they showed that crypto gadii is east of the Mississippi. So this is hot news at the time that it is not out west. It is here. These people never left. So that was the little letter that we wrote about with this guy in pasco county getting it and the cdc the guy who works on it is sean lockhart who's still at the cdc doing fungus stuff but here's proof that gadii is not just out west okay i wanted to throw that little tidbit in any other comments from our fellows attendings that i didn't cover because i didn't cover a ton of stuff <laughs> so what kind of pearls does anyone else have if you have time so yes. Just a question. Or like, questions. Thank you. So, you, like, if you have a meningitis and you have cryptococcus, does the antigen distinguish between neoformans and gadii, or how do you? It doesn't distinguish between the two, and so you would have to have the lab actually culture it. Okay. And then um, some cases of crypto have no capsule, and that really screws you up because the antigen is negative. Mm -hmm. So you can have, but the virulent crypto is the capsular kind. But if it's a rare non-capsular crypto, you may have a negative antigen. 
So keep that in mind. Those are rare entities. Now, some of the articles get into cross reaction, which I sent an article in a week or two ago, that if you order, if you got a disseminated histo case, you can have blastoantigen and coxipazib, but you know, you haven't, it, it, there's a lot of cross reaction. So it can, it can confuse you. And that is, needs to be kept in mind. Crypto is crypto. I don't think there are for your boards though. This is a nice board question. This guy has trichosporin bigelii, which can give you, which is a yeast like Canada dissemination kill you. And the crypto antigen's positive. So that's the one case you can have a false positive crypto antigen is trichosporin bigelii, which we've had at Moffitt. So those are rare cases of false positive crypto antigens. False positive blastohisto and uh, coxy, they can morph together. 